Yeah. Okay, super. Excellent. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me to be here. I'm really thrilled. Anne is doing so much good stuff, uh, both in breadth and depth. I'm really honored that you've invited me to talk, so thank you very much. Uh, I am Heather Pivova. I am a postdoc with Duke University, um, affiliated with the Dryad Repository. I live in Vancouver, Canada, and so I'm also a postdoc at the University of British Columbia. Um, a lucky person to have multiple affiliations. And as my day job, I track the impact of data. Uh, for my day job. And this is really a working presentation because for the last few months I've had my head down and my fingers in, in a bunch of different projects um, and I'm going to try to pull them all together into this presentation uh, to let you know uh, what I'm currently working on about data metrics and making them matter. Specifically I've been working in three areas. Um, I've been working on uh, collecting more evidence, so doing research studies. I've been working on uh, thinking about a framework and all the ways that tracking data matters and what that means for our policies. And finally, I've been building tools uh, to make that data tracking easier. So I'll try to interleave those. Um, and I'd love feedback in the questions. As you know, we're going into OA week, and I look forward to um, continuing to tell this story. So your questions would be really appreciated in your feedback. OK, so I'm going to start with uh, some things that I've done previously to get us warmed up. So one of the things one of the ways that we can track data to get to so you have a sense of what I mean by tracking data and what we can learn from it let's imagine uh, that we find 10 data repositories that existed in 2005 and so I did this 10 data repositories some of them are journal data repositories and picked 100 random data sets um, that were deposited in 2005 and then use citations to the papers that describe the data collection uh, from Web of Knowledge and Google Scholar and uh, text mining in the full text of papers to look for ex those accession numbers and then calculated for each of those 10 repositories how many times is there evidence that that data has been reused in the scholarly literature over time. So this graph is some preliminary results showing for data sets deposited in a publicly available repository in 2005, how many times cumulatively is there evidence they've been used. And you can see there's differences in different repositories. There's lots more that we can dig into here to learn about best practices. Um, using similar data to this, we can start to examine, does data reuse, does making data available truly give it the new lease on life that we think it does? So this graph, the light blue line that's going down, is evidence of data reuse by authors who have surnames in common <laughs> with the authors who deposited the data sets. So this is our best guess at a large scale of who had access to the data. How many papers did the data collecting authors publish? And you can see for, in this case, data uh, made available in 2007, they published a lot initially, and then it tapered off over time, presumably as they went on to uh, collect more data and do bigger and better things. The dark blue line that's increasing is, is authors who we don't think necessarily had ties with those authors. They're people who found it on the internet in the data repositories. And you can see that's going up. And so this is the beginning of evidence that data has a new lease on life. Now that the true height to that blue line, how it compares with the light blue line, that's, that's more evidence that we're hoping to, to collect. Um, more, more sorts of analyses I've done with uh, this sort of uh, reuse data is to see what is the impact per funding dollar of making this sort of data available. So if we look at traditional research funding and, and the amount of funding uh, a study gets um, and then how many papers are produced, about $400,000 US results in about 16 papers. Now that's a gross oversimplification, but it's that sort of order of magnitude. At the, at the level of um, funding the Dryad data repository when it's at scale, at similar levels of data reuse to the ones that I've been measuring um, in the previous slides, $400,000 would facilitate a thousand reuse papers. And so this sort of evidence can potentially uh, inform funders that yes, you really are getting good scientific ROI uh, bang for your buck by funding data repositories. And so that uh, analysis was written up in a nature letter uh, on my blog. So that's, that's some of the analysis that I've done in the past. So let's put this in the greater context of why should we track the impact of data uh, more specifically if we delineate some reasons. The first and most obvious is to encourage data archiving. So if we can um, suggest to 
to researchers who make their data available um, that they get a higher citation rate or they get more recognition, uh, that's an incentive, a personal incentive to them to make their data available. Furthermore, the more useful they make, they make their data, the higher those reuse tracking numbers would be and the higher their reward would conceivably be. And so tracking data and making that tracking information available uh, rewards the most useful collection, curation and dissemination of data. It also allows us to include all the relevant contributors in the reward structure. So often, pe there's, often people who collect data aren't necessarily pass all the uh, hurdles to be an author of a paper, but they are certainly an author of a data set. Enabling data sets to be uh, standalone entities and that receive their own rewards um, facilitates these sorts of contr contrib uh, contributors to play a role in the scholarly ecosystem, a, a more official role than they have until now. Uh, doing this sort of tracking and pulling out um, and teasing through the data allows people to discover associated analyses and data sets and research communities. So who reuses what? Do those people cluster together in some way you couldn't tell based on the keywords of their papers, for example? Importantly, it alerts investigators of reanalyses. It's easy to forget when we are not the authors of data sets ourselves, that when you make your data available, it's really hard right now to actually know who does anything with it. And, and we're interested, I think, as researchers, we want to know that they did the right thing, that they were responsible with it. Uh, we're, we're curious, it strokes our ego. We want the opportunity to respond um, and to do that, we need to know when it happens. Google alerts just don't cut it. We need to do more robust data tracking than that. It will allow us in the future to build filters for frequently used um, data sets. People may want to say, you know what, if other people have used it in the past, that's a good indicator that it's easy to use um, or perhaps good quality. So let me look for those. Or alternatively, some researchers might say, you know what, are there data sets out there that meet these various criteria that I have, but they have not been reused a lot? That may be an um, opportunity to really leverage some uh, scholarly resources that are, other, that are neglected, um, but potentially important. Tracking data uh, will allow us to um, when, when a data set is detected to be problematic, either because a method is found to have limitations that people didn't understand before, um, there might have been uh, data um, uh, manipulation or, or, or poor ethics in the data collection that's only discovered later. Right now, it's really hard to, to understand the implications that that's had on the scholarly literature. Um, and this, this is the way science is supposed to work. We're supposed to keep learning new things. So we really need to know what's the, what are the follow-on effects. And, and being able to track data uh, is important to facilitate that. Importantly, I think it will help us avoid harmful shoehorning. So right now we're doing various um, we're doing various um, hacks, I think, on the scholarly communication system to let uh, data enjoy many of the benefits that scholarly articles have. So we're assigning it DOIs, we're creating data journals, and various other things that some of them I think are, are maybe the appropriate thing. Some I think have limitations and we're really doing it because there are not good ways to track data and to reward data. Um, and so by building those good ways, we can stop shoehorning uh, when it's not appropriate. Um, data is actually, as, as you know, uh, gaining ground and is relatively far along in this sort of acceptance in the scholarly ecosystem relative to some other data types. So software citation is much farther behind data citation um, and, and, citation and, and other products are even farther behind that. So by tracking data sets, uh, we're trailblazing for other important research types. And finally, and importantly, it helps us drive policy funding and tool requirements based on evidence. To the extent we're doing science and, and science is based on evidence, surely our science policy should be based on evidence as well. Okay, so now um, I'm going to take a, a break in this um, articulation uh, as I try to move try to highlight for you all the different ways that data tracking is important to give you some first uh, results. Uh, this, these haven't been published yet. Um, so appreciate
get your feedback later. Uh, oh, that's really greeny. So I'm, I looked at the database, um, the Gene Expression Omnibus database. It has one particular type of data in it, Gene Expression Microarray data, um, and it's hosted by the NCBI in the US. And for various reasons, it's a great one uh, to do reuse studies. So I focused on it several times, and I focused on it again for this study. What I've done, oh, I don't have a slide in here, but what I did. Um, I used, I used uh, full text mining to identify 11,000 papers that created uh, gene expression microarray data. And then I got their PubMed IDs that described their data and their accession numbers. And I looked for those identifiers in PubMed Central, wherever I could find them. And uh, consider those the citations to the papers. So in this graph, what we can see, the years, there's one little graph here for every year uh, that data was deposited. Data was deposited into GEO between the year 2001, about till recently, um, and the, the, um, the tan line is uh, data set, the data behind the uh, gene expression microarray study is not available in GEO, and the blue line is the data behind that study is available in GEO. I can find that link um, to the GEO uh, data repository, and the graph is of the number of citations um, that those papers have received. It's a density graph of number of citations. So what you can see is that the lines, the, the tan and the blue lines are not on top of each other. <laughs> if they were on top of each other, that would mean there's no difference in the number of citations between whether data is made available or not. The fact that the blue line is systematically to the right uh, means that studies with data available have received more citations uh, in aggregate than, than similar studies with data not available. I've got a few more graphs of that same uh, data set showing a few different things. So this again um, is the number of, um, is, is showing Actually, for time, I'm going to skip this one. This one is, um, remember I had a light blue line and a dark blue line earlier on uh, with authors that um, created the data? In this line, in this graph, that's the um, orange line going down. So the authors who, uh, the original data collecting authors, the number of papers that they have published with their data sets is high in the first few years after data publication at the zero and goes down with years after the data has been published. And the blue line here is the number of authors, uh, excuse me, is the number of papers by authors who we think do not, are not the same people as those who collected the data. And again, you can see it going up. Now, the, the different panels are the different years that the data was deposited. Um, early on in 2001, there wasn't very much action here at all. And it, it gets really interesting in, in 2004 and five and six, when there's been uh, four or six years um, for, for data reuse to occur. And you can really see that blue line is really taking off um, and the, and the um, original author line isn't. So it's yet more evidence, excuse me, for that new life uh, that we believe data uh, archiving to facilitate. Um, this graph here um, is, is um, a cumulative number of reuses um, in the years since data publication. Some people say, if we make the data available, will anyone use it? And this graph really says, yes, <laughs> um, in aggregate, uh, data really is used. Those lines are going up um, and there, there's no sign of them uh, flattening out. This one is interesting. So in this case, um, the, the x-axis, the years, are when uh, data, when the data sets were made available, and the line is how many citations they have when their data is made available. Um, and so the fact that in 2005, for example, that line is really high above the dotted line means that um, for papers published in 2005, they've received about 25% more citations uh, than, than similar papers whose data has not been made available. Um, you can see that as we get to papers published more frequently, excuse me, more recently, that citation benefit um, tapers off. 
And I think that's because if they haven't had long enough, it's, it's potentially for a lot of reasons that we can talk about later. One is they haven't had long enough to, um, to achieve the appropriate amount of reuse. Uh, some of you with eagle eyes and good memories um, and a deep fascination for data citation <laughs> might be noticing that these estimates um, are lower than the estimates um, I've calculated previously and we can talk about that um, at some other point if you'd like. And finally, this paper here shows an interesting thing. Um, so like I said, I looked for accession numbers. So GEO doesn't give DOIs for data, they give unique accession numbers. So I looked in PubMed Central for accession numbers and tried to calculate how many accession numbers, when someone reuses data, do they just reuse one data set in their paper or do they reuse many? And each of these uh, orange dots says how many data sets a data reuse paper used. So you can see some data at the top, some data reuse papers used as many as 50 data sets calculated this way. Most down near the bottom, you can see only use one. But you can see that number is increasing over time. And that, um, and so, so the data reuse studies, I think, are getting more and more sophisticated over time, which is another good indicator that we're onto something with all this data archiving stuff. Okay, so, so studies like that, you can only do that when you can track data. Um, I've used some hacky estimating um, uh, methods to do that. If we could track it better, uh, these sorts of studies would be easier and more accurate. So, so when I say do it better, what do we want to do, right? What do we want to be doing better? What do we want to count? So we want to count data set citations in the academic literature. So citations uh, in papers, uh, wherever they may be. We also want to track impact beyond citations. So is somebody using something um, in, uh, as a method validation that doesn't make it into their paper is part of their research, but they don't have, uh, have a need to cite it in their in their publication because it's more of a background step. We're not tracking that right now. We could be potentially be uh, as online as a lab notebooks go online, um, as people write blog posts, things like that. Tracking the impact beyond academic research, um, education and training is one obvious example of impacts that we're just not tracking at all right now, but it would be great to do that. Reuses of the reuses. So if somebody does a meta-analysis um, of, of a paper, how much impact, excuse me, if somebody does a, does a meta, does a analysis that uses many data sets, how much impact does that study have, right? And how much impact do the studies that rely on that study have? These second order uses um, is really important to, to estimate the impact that the original uh, ground data has. And that is currently um, outside our scope for the most part. Tracking something that I'm calling impact flavor. So some data sets are probably useful um, to do method validation. Some data sets are probably more useful to do uh, replication, some, some to look at certain kinds of new hypotheses. Um, they're, they're, it's not just a one-dimensional scale um, where everything is competing the same way. Uh, chocolate and strawberry ice cream can both be really good, and the world is better for having both of them. We don't just want papers with more citations in the academic literature. We also want ones that are really useful for grad students. We also want, want ones that are really useful for citizen scientists to build on. So there's a lot of different ways that things can have impact, and we want to um, our, our metrics to reflect that. So how do we get there? One uh, that I think Anne's and everyone has been working hard on is standardizing, right? Standardizing data citation format, standardizing where they should go, standardizing identifiers. Uh, that's really the bedrock. There's been a lot of emphasis there and, and there needs to be, and that's great. Um, and let me now say there's, as, we, as everyone knows, uh, there's steps beyond that. And I think we're starting to be able to have the time and energy to start to look at those. So educating, encouraging, expecting, and enforcing data citation. Those ANDS websites are great places to go um, and great places to point people to, um, to know what to do. Talking to our journals, talking to our funders um, as peer reviewers, doing everything we can uh, to really raise awareness here. 
there's still a lot of problematic citation policies out there. Uh, one is a limitation on the number of references is really problematic because we expect people to cite data citation. Um, another one I just learned about t a few weeks ago, the journal Cell, uh, which is a high impact journal, I think does not allow people to cite data uh, in their references lists from what I understand uh, because they don't consider it a peer-reviewed resource um, in general and they only allow peer-reviewed resources to be cited in the references list. Things like that are really going to get in the way um, of, our, of our policies and so we need to do some, some talking and some listening and some figuring out I think around those. Excuse me just a sec. <coughs> Okay, we need to open up machine readable reference lists. We ourselves need to share more data, more usage data, and build tools. So now I'll segue into my, my third uh, area that I've been working on. I think as all of you are probably aware, for years now, uh, we've been aware that although we're making lots of DOIs for data sets, making lots of ways and encouraging people to put them in reference lists, on, at least in my um, behalf, at least for me, I naively assumed our existing um, citation tools would therefore be able to track those. And they, they were not able to track them just because they looked like a DOI uh, did not mean that Scopus and Web of Science could magically uh, index them and, and make that information available. So for more than two years, um, that has not been working. Uh, and the fantastic news is that uh, now, um, Thomson Reuters is all set to release the Data Citation Index, I believe this month, um, though I think some of you on this call may know a lot more about it than I do. Um, and so that's, that's game changing, right? All of a sudden, we really can start to um, be good on the promises we've been making to people uh, to cite data sets. And so I actually want to uh, just pause to really emphasize that this is really a fantastic step and I can't wait um, until it comes out. <clears throat> I want to pause because now I want to say but, <laughs> right? So now I want to say the problem is that, that of course, uh, Thomson Reuters is doing this um, for the same reasons, in the same way that they make all their products, um, and they need to recoup their costs on that, and the way they do that is by subscription, and, and subscriptions are barrier-based, and all of that means people, we can't mash up that data. We can't read the citation data, is is going to be um, barrier based in some ways, just like right now, uh, citation data for articles does not flow like water, nor will citation data for data flow like water. And that's a real shame because that really limits uh, what we can use it, the way we can use it for all of the purposes uh, I outlined earlier. And for that reason, and some others I'll, I'll mention briefly, um, Jason Prem, a uh, grad student at, UN, at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Myself have founded a nonprofit called Impact Story. Uh, it used to be called Total Impact. We just renamed and relaunched a month ago. And the idea of Impact Story is to go beyond the impact factor for articles. So to do article uh, based, to do to do item-based metrics rather than container-based metrics, and then move beyond the article, move to data, move to software, um, appreciate all those things as the first-class scholarly objects that they are. The web promises new tools for conversation, so there's not just citations, there's reference managers and social bookmarking and social networks. Um, as Karen mentioned, Mendeley is one of these uh, social reference managers. Right now I think Mendeley mostly people use it for articles, but I really think there's a chance that people may start to use it more and more for data, just as a way of bookmarking data to say, you know what, this is in my data library. This is something I want to have handy to reference. Twitter, people, I don't think right now many people are talking about data sets on Twitter, but surely I, I choose to believe and I think why not? I think it's only a matter of time before people tweet about things and say, did you see this uh, recent data set? Wow, or wow, that, you know, either wow good or wow bad, who knows. Uh, but to it, all these different ways that people talk, talk and interact online, all these scholarly tools, I think uh, data is going to work their way into them. And so the, all of those different um, tools and their associated metrics are going under the name Altmetrics right now. Um, so bibliometrics um, is, 
is more citation based and alt metrics includes this broader array of uses uh, where scholars can really do the things they're otherwise doing and we can track and see what they're see what's happening. Uh, there are various altmetrics tools, so in addition to Impact Story, um, I really encourage you to go check these out. Altmetric.com tracks uh, DOIs to data sets, plus article of metrics um, is article-based, uh, but is, is a granddaddy in this field, um, and there's Reader Meter and Science Card as well. Let me tell you a bit more about Impact Story, give you a couple of screenshots. It's at impactstory.org. You want to have a look. So, um, as of last night, I think <laughs> it now accepts um, an ORCID ID. So, if you're a researcher or um, want to uh, pretend to be one on TV, you can go apply for an ORCID ID. You just go register for an ORCID ID. It just takes a few seconds to get, and then you, it's a it's a unique identifier for researchers, and then they can ident uh, associate their scholarly products with their with their unique researcher identifier. Right now, the focus is obviously on articles, but there's other uh, types of metrics that are allowed, all, excuse me, there are other types of products that are allowed and encouraged, including data sets. I think, um, I think that will start to get more and more play. So you can enter your ORCID ID um, or your article ID or your Dryad author name, um, and we're looking to, yeah. Um, there the ORCID badge and, and what it returns for you uh, based on the ar various scholarly articles that you tell Impact Story about is metrics. So here uh, someone entered a bunch of articles and a data set and you can see that, that uh, Impact Story went off and looked uh, all around the web for, for impacts, uh, excuse me, for metrics of use and impact um, and and puts data sets right on that same page, right on the same, you could imagine this is a live CV for a scholar. It not only includes their article, it also includes their data sets. Um, so there's my data sets in Dryad, for example. Um, and when you drill in, when you click on this, it doesn't just give you these badges that says highly viewed, it then says, what does viewed mean? In Dryad, it reveals their uh, usage data, and these, these numbers here are percentiles. So those are the percentiles um, that that data set, how many views has that data set received relative to other Dryad data sets deposited that same year. And then the badges show um, are given when that's a highly when that's a uh, the percentiles over seventy five percent, and so this this starts to show you a way that we can give context uh, to the amount of uh, usage that data sets have, so that scholars can really be proud of this, show it off, talk about it in their grant packages, and so on. Uh, Impact Story, uh, it's designed to be mashed up, so the data is as open as we can make it. Um, it's as open as the, the data sources will let us make it be. It, you can download it in a comma-separated value format, um, and it's got an open API. It's, it itself is open source and always will be. So in some, in, as I wrap up, um, are there other ways that we can make uh, data count? And there certainly are. Uh, one that I think the more people on board with this, the better. Uh, we really need to do agile research with decision makers. So as funders start to implement policies, as journals start to implement policies, let's, let's really be doing the research to know um, what are the benefits of these policies, what are the drawbacks, is it worth it? Let's really be, uh, be critical and evaluative and learn from what's going on. And finally, uh, whenever we can, with our peer review hats on, with our conference organizing hats on, with our, uh, with our grant reviewing hats on, um, asking for and acting on evidence of data impact. I think we really are in this age right now where there are thousands of flowers blooming, and, and it's a great time to be out there with our measuring sticks uh, to understand exactly how big those blooms are. Thanks very much.